Our chapel speaker today is Dr. Oscar Lopez. He joined the Dallas Seminary faculty in 1998 and currently serves as professor of pastoral ministries. As a professor, church planter, pastor, conference speaker, and musician, Dr. Lopez is a versatile servant of the Lord. For uh, more than 38 years, he's played a pivotal role with Central America Mission, now known as CAM International, proclaiming God's word in many bilingual and bicultural contexts. He is an international worship consultant who has taught seminars in the United States, Canada, Latin America, and Spain. And he's also ministered in East Asia and East Africa. Before coming to Dallas Seminary, Dr. Lopez spent 12 years as a faculty member at Central America Theological Seminary in Guatemala City, and also worked as a radio station manager and program director. He and his wife, Peggy, have three adult children and two grandchildren. I'd like you to join with me in welcoming uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Oscar Lopez. Thank you. I'll treat you to my Norwegian accent today. <laughs> okay. A servant who loves personal praise, he also loves temptation. Let me say it again. A servant who loves personal praise, he also loves temptation. The Roman centurion went down romping in, under the deck of a Roman ship. And he went to talk to those horsemen chained under the deck. And with a big grin in his face, he went and said, whip his whip, crack it, and said, I have a great news for you today. The general is treating you to filet mignon for lunch. And all the slaves went shouting and screaming the chains word with a deafening sound there. And so then he said after that, he cracked his whip again and he said, and the emperor after lunch wants to go water skiing. <laughs> if you were to ask me, uh, which one of the three roles would you like to have, play? The one of the emperor, the general, the one of the uh, centurion, or the horseman under the deck, doing all the work, but none seen by, not, by nobody. So I will say immediately, uh, probably I, I humble enough to say that my personality doesn't fit the general. Uh, probably I will choose the centurion. He has a stern voice, power, a whip, and I love his uniform. <laughs> okay. But for me to be a servant, to be a slave, to be under the deck, doing all the work and not getting any praise, that doesn't fit my ambitions. Well, some of you will say, I will question you for that. You say, well, see, you are, you are Hispanic. You are illegal. You fit the servant image. <laughs> And even some of you say you look like an alien. <laughs> yeah, I have a distorted face, but it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but let me uh, clarify that for you. Listen, I am one of the few Hispanics who finished high school. In fact, I have a BA. And don't tell this to anyone. I'm one of the few Latins who have a THM from Dallas Theological Seminary. In fact, I spent uh, about 12 years of my life and over $100,000 trying to get a THD from Dallas Theological Seminary. <laughs> and you want me to be a servant? <laughs> you must be kidding. See, I have, the Lord has called me not to be a servant, it's to be someone else. And I will say that in our pursuit of our ministry, many times we may fall in the trap of pursuing personal praise. Maybe given to us, or maybe we are after it. You know, I feel hurt. 
Tuesday here was uh, Pastor Nelson. Chapel was full. Look today. <laughs> how, do you, how, how do I feel? Okay. But I know of a man who was a theologian, a missionary, a pastor, a church planter, a man of God. And in his uh, sacrifice for the Lord Jesus Christ, he founded the church. And through some friends, he got some feedback. And some of the friends said, listen, the church you just founded is having great problems. One of them is that they have a lot of um, different parties in them. Some of them are admirers of Apollos, the great rhetorician, great homiletical skills. Some of them love Cephas because he is really the founder of the mother church. Some of them said that they are of the party of Christ. And some of you like you because you founded the church. So immediately Paul detected that there was something wrong with the church, and he wrote them a letter based on that report. And basically, he has three purposes in that letter. One is to correct the misconduct of the believers at the Church of Corinth. The second one is to explain them about worship through the Lord's Supper. And finally, talking about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He writes them a letter, and he wants to correct that. If we look at the purpose there, there are three purposes, but Paul is a pastor, and he's talking to his congregation. I am here a professor talking to a, an institution. But still, the theological truth will be proved to be good for us today. So I would like you to open your Bibles to First uh, Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians chapter 4. And as you look at this uh, chapter, it comes immediately after the discussion of the different parties at the church in Corinth. And I am looking just at about 14 verses here, and I'm not going to look at the detail of the whole chapter, but I am looking at three metaphors that Paul is using to describe what he has in mind. And these three, three metaphors will give us a clear picture, a painting, a pictorial picture of what he wants to say concerning the response to personal praise. So the question we are trying to answer today is, how should I respond to personal praise? Or how should I respond when I want to seek and look after personal praise? So we have three metaphors, one in verses 1, the next one in verse 10, and then the verse, nine, verse 13. And we're going to look at three, three metaphors. The basic question is, how do I respond? to personal praise, whether given to me or being sought after? And the answer is going to be very simple. Consider yourself a servant. That's the answer. Let's look at verse 1, where we find it. So then, men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must be faithful. Right there you have the first metaphor, and the first metaphor is servants. And servants here, Paul is not using the word doulos, he is not using the word diaconos, though it is the same meanings in chapter 3, 5 of diaconos. And the real meaning of the word is to be a servant is to be an assistant. You are not the CEO, you are just helping someone else. So it could be an assistant to a king, it could be an assistant to the manager, or even can be an assistant to someone in the Sanhedrin. That's the role. Now, some have stretched the meaning of the word, and they say that it referred because of the lexical meaning of huperetes, that refers to someone being under a deck of a galley, a Roman galley. But according to the Net Bible, that is not true. <laughs> so I'm safe. Okay, I'm safe. But when I look at the word, it's very simple. Just you are not the one you think you are. If you are a follower of Christ, you are an assistant to the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you feel about it? Well, the closest example I have here is that, that DTS. You are a member, when you come to the DTS to teach, you are become a member of this distinguished faculty. 
And we, there is a system, you come as an assistant, then you go to the next echelon, associate professor, you go to the next one, professor, you go to the next one, senior professor, and then you keep going until you reach the Hendricks and Pentecosts, you know, way up there, you know, <laughs> even, okay. So, I come to Dallas Seminary and I come and I enter as a, an assistant professor. How do, I feel, how do I feel about it? And I will say that we are not looking down upon the different echelons and merit-rewarding uh, uh, levels that we have. But I will say that the main point is, even you are at the way at the top, if you are a follower of Christ, consider yourself just an assistant of the Lord Jesus Christ, nothing else. You say, well, that sounds too, not too encouraging, you know, not too appetizing. When, when you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, you know, I have come not to be served, but to serve, and to live a life, my life a ransom for many. If the Lord Jesus Christ said, I came to serve and not to be served, my question to you is, are you willing to be a servant, an assistant of the Lord Jesus Christ? The answer is, are you seeking for praise or are you giving praise? And the first answer is, consider yourself to be an assistant of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second metaphor, we find it in, uh, in close to this one, though I consider it part of the first one to be a servant. And he talks about a servant must be found faithful. And the word faithful for here is the word economist. And simply means a man who receives a, a state and he's the manager of a state. He gets the keys, he gets the money, he gets the key codes, he gets everything, and even he has a description of what he's supposed to be doing. The same thing like in the, old, in the New Testament. Any manager was given a, what we would call a job description. He was accountable to the things. He didn't owe anything, own anything. He was just an economist. We use the word in Spanish the same way, morphologically and phonetically, economo. And in my country, an economo is one who receives the keys and everything from the government authorities. And usually, the place is given to someone who works in a high school that has room and board. So the economist becomes the owner of just about everything, but he is just administering those things. For example, he can buy pencils, hundreds of pencils, thousands of pounds of food, refrigerators, beds, everything. So he has a lot of money. So when in Guatemala you say, I am an economo, you said, lucky guy. Most of them are found guilty of fraud. <laughs> Isn't that something? And the Lord said, if you are a servant, an assistant, you must be found reliable, trustworthy. What do you have in hands? Material things, tangible things? No. The text says, you are entrusted with the mysteries of God. And the mysteries of God means a truth that was hidden, had been revealed, and continues to be supernatural in its content. And that's what you and I are being trusted with. The mysteries of God. Paul uses the word 20, 21 times. And he talks about the mystery of the church, the mystery of God in Christ, the mystery of the gospel. So all of that he has given to you. And if you consider yourself an, an assistant of the Lord Jesus Christ, God has placed in your hands and in my hands the mysteries of God. How do you feel about it? Do you want to be an assistant to the Lord Jesus Christ? The second metaphor, we find it in verse 9. And in verse 9 is uh, when you look at the, uh, the context of the passage, it's sandwiched between a very satirical or Paul using satire to talk to the arrogant Corinthians. And later, after the metaphor, he's talking about the sufferings of a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 9, you find he says, For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like men condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. 
Now he is going to paint the picture and say to you, listen, if you are a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, consider yourself an assistant of the mysteries of God. Secondly, consider yourself a servant willing to die. And what Paul has in mind here is the Roman victory parade. And you have all the lictors, you have the magistrates, you have the soldiers, you have the musicians, you have the emperor, and way at the end, you have the slaves, those prisoners of war, and Paul is combining the two figures, the victory parade leading to the Colosseum. And all of those who are prisoners of war are taken to the Colosseum to be laughed out, given to the beasts, and the morbid crowds just laughing as they are being killed. And finally, some of them put in the hands of the gladiators who are heavily armed and highly trained, so they died there. Consider yourself what? A servant willing to die. I remember a few years ago, we left uh, Dallas with my wife, Peggy, to begin another term in... Uh, Central America. And as we went all across Mexico, we entered Guatemala. And soon uh, before we realized, there was a car following us and getting in front of us and behind us in front. And I had a powerful, brand new 1982 Dodge Ram. And so I tested it and really went 90 miles an hour in the Mexican highway. Risky. We came to a snag in the Pan American Highway, so I had to stop. And the people, the uh, five men in the car, they were in front of us. Immediately, they jumped out of the car, two of them on my side, running with guns in their hands, and got to my door and aimed the guns right at me in my face. And I saw those black dot barrels saying, a bullet is coming just now. The other men went on the side of my wife, Peggy, and he was aiming a gun at her. They took the car, they left the freeway, got into a dirt road, began to go up a mountain, kept bouncing up and up a mountain until they got up to the end of the road. The dark came, and I said, I'm going to die. This happened every day in Guatemala. Political upheaval, criminal corruption, so I will not be, get alive of this one. So I came to reason, and I said, well, if I'm going to die now, why not preach the gospel to my captor? So I began to talk to the young man, and he was aiming a 45-millimeter gun right to me, and he said, don't you dare to run, because this grenade will catch you. So I sat down there in the dark, and I said, Lord, if these are the last minutes of my life, I might as well present the gospel. So I begin to talk to the man. You look like you are fast. Yeah, I am fast. Do you like what you are doing? Uh, sort of. <laughs> Do you know that you may be killed? Yeah, so what? Well, you know, there's a future. There's someone who can give you meaning in life. And that's Jesus Christ. And he can make, make you a new man. Would you like to believe in him and become a new creature in Christ? He died for your sins. He died for you. He looked at me and said, not today. I want to avenge of all of those who have hurt me. And then at the end, he said, here's my gun. And I said, I don't know how to use them. <laughs> you better keep it. But there was a moment when I said, okay, if I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, am I ready to die for him? And the answer should be, yes. He died for me on the cross. He gave it all for me. At least I can do that for him. I can die for my Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior. He was at the cross, and he said, it is finished, and he did it all for me. So, the first metaphor, in light of 
personal praise, whether you are receiving it or you are looking for it. The scripture's response is, consider yourself, first of all, to be a servant, an assistant of the Lord. Second, consider yourself to be a servant who is willing to die for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, in verse 13, we have the third metaphor. And then in verse 13, he said, when uh, we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become what? The scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. It doesn't sound too pretty. Are you willing to do that? And in this metaphor, we said, consider yourself just to be a despicable person for the sake of Christ. Both words are very similar in meaning, with the difference that the first one is uh, scum is in the plural, and that will make room to include scapegoats, the plural, and also the refuse is a really bad word, talks about a wasted waters who have created a little filthy, putrid film on top of it. Nobody cares for that and kicks them around. You don't have a use for that. You are nothing. And so Paul is saying, okay, I would like to ask you if you are willing to be seen as with contempt and even reproach. And when you look at it, you say, yes, Lord, I'm willing to do it. The Lord Jesus Christ will suffer that exactly for us. I have lived in the U.S., and I can live among minorities here, and I have learned some hard lessons the hard way. But also when I was in Guatemala, just in kindergarten and elementary school, the official religion of my country was the Roman Catholic. So therefore, in a class of 60, 70 students, I was the only Protestant. And you know how the children at school can be so mean, right? So they will, the 60, get around me and said, you are a Protestant. I'd say, I'm quiet. No, you are a Protestant. I'm quiet. No. And they begin to move me back and back, and they, they pin me down to the, wall, the back wall of the, of the classroom. And right there you said, you are a Jew. You spat on Jesus' face. No, I didn't do that. You are a despicable mason. No, I'm not that. I'm also. You are a filthy hallelujah. No. I knew that I was not a Pentecostal. You know, come from, a, <laughs> come from a Bible church. So, no, I'm not that. Okay. We'll go out to play out in the patio. They will not pick on me to be one of the members of the team. And can you imagine how it, that hurts to an eight-year, nine-year-old boy? I cannot play. And if someday they will invite me to play, they will not pass the ball to me. So what was the point? And I said, oh, how? What a great depression that creates in me. And the question for you will be the same. Are you willing to be mistreated like that for the sake of Christ? Are you willing to be an undesirable person for the ministry that you have been called upon to be a servant of Christ? We have seen three metaphors here, and Paul is answering the question. If you are getting flattery, or if you are seeking it, remember, consider yourself first a servant of Christ, an assistant. Secondly, consider yourself to be an, a, a servant willing to die for the Lord Jesus Christ. And thirdly, consider yourself to be even a despised person because of your, the sake of Christ. He went through all of that exactly. And according to Philippians chapter two, 2, even he went all the way to die on the cross and die crucified for me. And he's asking me today, how about yourself? Thank the Lord for many of you who are faithful servants. And some of you, the Lord has gifted you you are some of those cum laude. Some of you are those of one magna cum laude. 
And some of you will be ma summa cum laude. Words that I only know because they are in Latin. Okay? <laughs> but I will look and say yes. As a student, you may be tempted to seek praise or receive praise. And if you receive it, just consider yourself a lowly servant of Christ. Here in this context with my dear, some of them, my professor, Dr. Pentecost, and I, I'm surrounded by these dear men. Some of them have some skills that I wish I could have, homiletical skills. Some of them are prolific writers, and I want to be a prolific writer. Some of them travel all over the world. I would like to travel all over the world. Then I had to ask myself, why? And I had to go back to the scriptures and say, if my Lord Jesus Christ came to not to be served, but to serve, am I willing to be a lowly servant, an assistant, willing to die, willing to be despised by anyone else because of the sake of Christ? I would like to close with two beautiful examples. One has to do with a DTS student who graduated about seven, eight years ago. And I heard a report of him being in the place where he's ministering. And I heard one lady referring to him as this man has, every time I get close to this man, the lady said concerning this DTS grad, I feel the aroma of Christ. What a compliment. And I'm so happy to report also that, you know, the goals of the school, the school is designed to make servant leaders to bring glory to God, edify the church, and preach the gospel around the world. And also I'm happy to report, a few years ago, I heard from a, someone referring to one of our professors, a colleague, and said, how in the world that man is so humble? And he has a doctor's degree. A faculty member. And I said, praise the Lord. There are many out there and here in our school that are really true, lowly servants of Jesus Christ. So whenever you receive praise, thank the Lord for it, but immediately turn around and say, I am a whole, humble assistant of the Lord Jesus Christ, willing to die for him and ready to be despised by the world. And if you are tempted to seek it, remember, the Lord Jesus Christ became here to be a servant and even die for you and I. Paul in chapter 11 said, imitate Christ, imitate me as I imitate Christ. It will be nice if you can say the same, and I can say the same. Imitate me as I imitate the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you. Thank you.